Oh, it is such a privilege to be here with you today. And Mark, thank you for trusting us to just share into your your family and this body. And we're kind of surprised to be here because it wasn't in our plan. But oftentimes the things that aren't in our plan turn out being some of the most important things that we do. And this week I've kind of battled because we had a great time Wednesday night. And then there's so much I would like to say. I kind of feel like that Paul that, you know, he preached so long, somebody fell out the window. We're not going to do that. But I just, I, I was feeling just this weight of so much that God is depositing into you and how much he's pouring into you as a body of people. How th this is a, a crucial time in your development. And it's, you know, you have an incredible history, incredible life, incredible foundation. And then we're in this place saying, okay, God, where do we, where do we go? What's the next season look like? What is it? What are you saying? Because it's, it's not really important what men say. It's important what God says. And, and we want to hear his heart for what we do next and his heart for what he's saying. And so finally yesterday, it just I say, God, I need to know what my assignment is because I, I know how to do lots of stuff, but what's my assignment? And it just very clearly spoke that my assignment was the Holy Spirit. So that's, 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 that frees me then. I know where I'm supposed to go and I know what I'm supposed to share. So turn with me to the book of Ephesians and we are going to, we're going to do something just a little bit different. Um, Ephesians, and I think you guys did a study of Ephesians recently. Am I right in that, that you did one recently? One of the things that's always intrigued me about the book of Ephesians is that in each chapter of the book, there's a revelation of the Holy Spirit. And it gives us another facet of who the Holy Spirit is. And so we're, we're going to look at some of those over the next few minutes. So we're going to look at at least the first two chapters, I think. The Holy Spirit is the centerpiece for everything that we are. Jesus' death, resurrection purchased our salvation, our identity. But the, one of the greatest benefits of being in Christ is that he then gave us the Holy Spirit. In fact, he says, and Jesus himself said in John chapter 16, verse 7, he's, he's talking to his disciples who have had with him, been with him for this time. And he says to him, listen, it's to your benefit that I go. Let's put it in today's language. You're going to be better off if I'm gone. I mean... Can you imagine the mindset of the disciples? How are we going to be better off with you gone? He says, if I don't go, then I can't send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to equip you even further than I have. The Holy Spirit is going to be a greater benefit to you than my physical. That's terrifying. You're walking down the streets of Lake City. Would you rather have the physical presence of Jesus or the Holy Spirit as you know him now? Answer it honestly. You'd feel a lot more bold if Jesus was beside you. But he said, get to know this person of the Godhead that I'm depositing in you and knowing this person is going to be of even greater benefit. I don't know the Holy Spirit that well. I'm not that intimate with the Holy Spirit. I, but he wants us to be. And one of the marks of this church going forward is that you're going to carry the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in a way that people in this community begin to encounter Jesus because of what you carry. That's the heart of it. That's the heart of the gospel. That's what he desires for us. 
we, we have a strong theology of the kingdom of God. We understand that there's a, Jesus came and he taught two primary things. He taught the nature of his father and the nature of the kingdom. Those are kind of the two themes that run through what Jesus taught. And we understand the kingdom, but sometimes we have the kingdom theoretical instead of practical. Jesus makes this amazing statement in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 28. He makes this statement. He said, if I, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come among you. What that, what that means, what that says, is that any time the Holy Spirit operates through you, the kingdom of God is being manifest in that realm, and that space around you. Every time you prophesy, every time you pray for the sick, every time you release a, a word of encouragement by the Spirit, every time the Holy Spirit moves through you, the, the realm of the rule of our precious Christ is being extended into the earth. So the more I know the Holy Spirit and fellowship with the Holy Spirit, the more my life is going to become an expression of the kingdom of God, whether it's casting out demons, whether it's healing the sick, whether it's raising the dead. How, how many of you are hungry to see the dead raised? Let's just mess with you. Did you know a friend of mine in South Africa, his name is Surprise Satole. They see so many dead raised that they had to come up with rules for raising the dead. How would you like to be in a church where you had to have rules for raising the dead? Do you want to hear his main rule? So his primary rule he teaches his pastors is this. When you go to a funeral, you must go with your wife. When you get to the funeral, your wife must go and encourage the family and love on the family and bless the family and you know just, just be there as the loving, caring pastor that we need. But you must go over to the body and you must put your hand on the foot of the body and stand there. If the foot warms up, you announce to the group that they're about to see a resurrection. <laughs> if it stays cold, go encourage the family with your wife. Isn't that ridiculously simple? But it's not even in our mindsets to imagine that. Four of our spiritual kids, some of my spiritual kids, four of them have seen resurrection from the dead in the last two years. There's something breaking through of the kingdom and greater and greater and greater manifestation. But I've not seen my first one yet. Sally's seen her first one. We're going after it. Why? Because we want to see the kingdom of our precious Lord Jesus extended into this earth. I, I want to see Lake City, Florida trans, transformed by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. A people so full of His Spirit that everywhere they go, they carry His power and presence. And that's what radiates out from them. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. and Over this Sunday and then I'm gone for Father's Day and back again, and I'm going to do some more of Ephesians that Sunday. But let's just, let's just look at some of what Paul writes to the Ephesian church. I was very encouraged by what, <laughs> very encouraged by what Mark just shared. Chapter 1, look at verse 13. In him. You also, after listening to the message of the truth of the gospel, of your salvation, having believed, you were sealed in him. He's put a seal. You're the seal 
The Holy Spirit is the seal that is establishing our identity. It's establishing who we are. The Holy Spirit is given as that mark, that stamp, that impress, that authentication, the, the proof that you are Christ is the Holy Spirit working through you. That's the mark. That's the mark. Remember when Moses, Moses comes down off the mountain and you know the people have just been idiots and they make this golden calf and all this stuff is happening. He comes down with the tablets of the law and here are the people, God's people, worshiping idols and Moses is just throws in the tablets, they break. We go through that process. A- after that, God comes to Moses and says, Moses, from you know today, I'm gonna send an angel in front of you. And you know, they'll clear out the people and they'll take you in and they'll you know, but if I go to this people, I'm gonna kill them. Moses' response is no, take me out, you go with them. Because their identity is your presence. The mark of who they are is your presence. And if your presence doesn't go, I don't want to go. I'm not going to go with an angel. I'm going to go with your presence. The Holy Spirit in you is the seal, the identifying mark of God's hand on your life. I was raised in a very religious household. The only thing I knew of the Holy Spirit was that the Holy Spirit convicted us for sin, and that's as far as I ever knew the Holy Spirit. Then when we're on the mission field and we realized we couldn't do the work we're called to do, without a power that we didn't have. Something we didn't have, is we, we couldn't do this thing. One of the most difficult moments of my life, we were the beginning of our second term on the mission field, and Sally and I were leading a mission station up in the north of Kenya, a little place called Log Logo. And the, the nurse called me over to the dispensary, and I, I walked in the door and I hear her saying to me, this little girl on, on the examining table is dying, but I can't find anything medically wrong with her. And I walked around to the front of this little girl and I saw a demon choking this girl to death. And I'm a Baptist boy. We don't believe in those things. A little while later, I walked out of that dispensary and that little girl died. I went to my room in my house and I laid on the floor. And I said, never again. Never again will I stand in the face of the enemy and not have the power and authority to deal with darkness have the power and authority to extend the kingdom of our precious Christ. I got up off the floor filled with the Spirit. We ended up getting kicked out of the mission over it, but that's okay too. But, 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 but it's your identity. If you're powerless, you're missing a piece of your identity. And what God is doing in this body of people is He's brought you here as, as stewards of an incredible inheritance. But now let's be empowered by His Spirit and let's start carrying the power of His Spirit into the streets and into the community, into the society. Let's see it transform because we're carriers, not of a message, but of a presence. Not against messages. But too often our message becomes our identity. There were two great leaders in the Second Great Awakening, the Wesley brothers 
and Whitfield. And uh, both the Wesley brothers and Whitfield were impacted by the Moravians. And, and they, they're, between those two groups, they're responsible for almost a quarter of England coming to Christ during the Second Great Awakening. But if you've ever read the communication between the two of them, it is hilarious. The Wesley brothers were Armenian, and Whitfield was a Calvinist. And all of their communication is this discussion between Arminius and Calvin. And yet they saw equal numbers of people come to Christ in a move of the Spirit. It wasn't the doctrine that established the move of God. It was the presence of God in them that caused the establishing of what He called them to do. And you're in a moment where there's a seal being put on your arm and your heart. And it prophetically, in Song of Songs, now happens in the work of the Spirit. It's a mark of authentication. It's your identity. Lord, help me stay on track. I do like to chase rabbits. I, I get these big, juicy rabbits, and I just have to chase them a little bit. Oh. That word seal is the word that's used basically the head of a coin, the stamping on a coin is what authenticates that. And that's what we walk with. Next verse, verse 14. Who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a review to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. The, the word used there as pledge is a Greek word that in that time was primarily used as down payment. So the Holy Spirit is given to us as a down payment of all that He has for us. Have you ever put a down payment on a house you didn't want? No, you put down payments on something you want. He wants you. His heart, He's put a down payment of His Spirit into you. And it's that down payment of His life in you that marks you and sets you apart. He has given you a guarantee of an inheritance. And here's the down payment. Now, one of the frustrating things of the kingdom is as much as I don't like the phrase already, but not yet, there are elements of it that are correct. The reason I don't like the phrase is sometimes we use it to limit what's available to us. And I want to take the limit off what's available. Because I want to live in everything available to me now. What's in the down payment? A whole bunch. Just read the New Testament. Read the book of Acts. That's an expression of what the down payment produces in us. And as we surrender to Him, as we allow Him to work, as we allow Him to do what He wants to do in our lives, there's an extension of His kingdom that happens through us. And it comes from this internal life of the Spirit that starts as a seal, as a guarantee, but then it outflows from us into society around us. Ever since I've been here, I've been just seeing glimpses, little glimpses of this town transformed. And every time I see it, it's, it's not about meetings. It's about His people. In modern, in modern Greek, the, that word down payment has actually changed. It's, you know, meanings of words change over time, and that's just kind of the way it works. In modern Greek, 
that word down payment is now the word for an engagement ring. <laughs> he put an engagement ring on you, David. His Holy Spirit is an engagement ring. It's a promise of a future. It's a promise of a family. It's a promise of belonging. It's a promise that we're going somewhere. It's a promise that we're going to fulfill all of the things that are in our heart to see because He put an engagement ring on you. Holy Spirit. And that marking changes my identity forever. I don't even go by my last name anymore. I go by a different name because I'm engaged. I'm drawn into a family. I belong to the King of Kings. Some of you guys struggle with the image of you wearing a wedding dress. That'd be all right. I always tell the ladies, if you struggle with being called a man in Scripture, we struggle with wearing a wedding dress. I mean, let's just get over it. Just be who God called us to be. You're engaged to the King of Kings. That's the revelation. And we won't take a lot of time here, but verse 17. He gave you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. Thank you guys for singing that song today. Sometimes all of us need little confirmations that we're in the right passage of Scripture for a morning. Well, your song was my confirmation this morning. And then Mark summed it up with a seal. But the context of that wisdom of revelation, we too often want to make that future instead of identity. It is future, but it's also identity. And I think in the context of chapter 1, He's wanting to understand the nature of this engagement with the Holy Spirit. What has the Holy Spirit done in your life? Now, I hate the article. Whenever I write, I always drop the V off because Holy Spirit's a person, not a thing. Um, but we've we, we we got to walk in relationship with Holy Spirit. I need wisdom and revelation to know what that looks like. What does it look like in your job? What does it look like in your life? How, how does this come into who you are? We, uh, Sal, Sally and I had the privilege of leading a lot of teams to Brazil and to South Africa and to a lot of different places. But one of the joys of that is always watching people be transformed by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And I, I remember one particular trip we were on. There was a, a medical doctor. She's an emergency room doctor in Kentucky. And uh, she came on the trip with us. And we're in a meeting in Brazil and this real revival presence. And she's down the front as part of the prayer team. And she has about 30 people in her line to pray for. And so this medical doctor prays for the first one and they get healed. And I'm, she's just right here down. I'm on the platform, my translator. She's right here. And I see her look up at me and there's just look of relief that one got healed. Because her, her doctor hat isn't used to that. And then she prayed for the second one and they got healed. Then she prayed for the third one, and they got healed. And I see this doctor starting to look at her hands, trying to figure, what is this? She went through every person in her line that night, and every single person got healed. And this doctor is a complete wreck, because there's no grid for what the Holy Spirit in her is doing through her. <laughs> Don't you want to get messed up like that? She went back to the hospital and back to work. And 
before she went to work the first time after the trip, she said, God, how do I do what happened there in the emergency room? And he said, you don't have to do anything. Just pray in the Spirit under your breath for the entire day. So she did. At the end of a week, she has supervisors come in and asking what's different because there's so many people being transformed and she's not doing anything but just doing what she's supposed to do as a doctor. But she's praying in tongues and the power of God is working in the lives of people and people are being transformed and they're being healed and being changed and people that they didn't think were going to live are living and they're thinking, what's happening? You got a seal. You got an engagement ring. It's time for us as a church to step up into who we have and who we know so that our identity which is secure in Christ becomes empowered by His Spirit so I'm living in the fullness of my identity but I'm also allowing that fullness to throw, flow through me into the lives of others. Are you hungry? I'm starving. Because with everything we've seen, I know there's so much more. So much more. We're just touching, we're touching the surface, we're touching just the edges of what's available to us. Chapter 2. Verse 18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. In context, it's Jew and Gentile coming together in one access. It's the breaking down of every division. It's the, it's the destroying of all divides that can separate us. In Christ, there's, a, there's something that happens in the Spirit that brings us together. The, the walls of division are broken down. I think one of the greatest needs in our nation right now is for the people of God to have an anointing of the Spirit that breaks down divisions because we're so divided. If we're not careful, we pick sides instead of carry the presence. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a side. I'm not saying you shouldn't vote. I'm not saying we shouldn't be good patriarchs. I believe in that. I believe we have this incredible privilege as, as people. But when we start making the side we pick our identity, we miss the seal, the engagement ring. We're called to be a people of His presence. I believe that we're coming into a season where the body of Christ is going to be representing a life and unity and fellowship that the rest of the world looks at and says, how are you doing that? Our spiritual dad was a man by the name of Philip Mohabir. He was a Guyanese um, in the 60s, when Guyana went fully communist, he said, he came to the Lord and said, okay, Lord, how do I live in this environment and represent you well? And so the Lord said, they're wanting to put the entire nation into communes. I want you to build a spirit-filled Christian commune. And so he did a little place called Haruni. I've been there a bunch of times. And in this place, they lived in the lifestyle that the communist government was requiring. The only difference was theirs worked 
and nobody else did. Because there's unity. There's genuine love and care for each other. There's honest sharing of life together. There's no division and fighting and stealing and theft and all the stuff that was going on all across the nation. So guess where the government goes to find out how to make the rest of them work? What are you doing different than we're doing? But we just invite the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the wall is broken down. The division is gone. Yeah, the worst part of COVID for us was that all the kind of right-wing Republicans left because we abided by certain rules. And all of the left left us because we didn't abide by the rules strong enough. <laughs> Hello? Somehow we have to be a people of the Spirit and not be a people driven by the impulses of what's going on around us. The, the truth is, this seal, this mark of the Spirit is in us as a sealing of our identity. But the Holy Spirit is on you for you to minister to every person around you. You have the gifts of the Spirit, not just to wear as merit badges, but you have the gifts of the Spirit so that you can extend the kingdom by sharing those things that come from the Holy Spirit to people around you. When did you last prophesy in Walmart? Or at work? When did, when did you last lay hands on an engine that was misbehaving? See, my brain hurts when I do that. We're at the lake, and you can say something. I know. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. So we're at the lake. We're, we went out on a boat, took Sally's brother and her family out on a boat, and we come back, and go up to our car and click, 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 click. The battery is totally dead. There's nobody around, nobody to jump us. And Sal's brother's temperature is rising fairly rapidly. And so I'm trying to figure out how far it is to walk to get help. Sal walks around the front, lays hands on the hood and says, start in Jesus' name. Tells your brother, get in. I'm like, oh Jesus. Somehow I have trouble with that. I just, but, but he, who's in you? Who's in us? He's in you for you, but he's on you to share the life of God with those around you. This church, one of your identifying marks is going to be how you love people. But that's going to be manifest through how well you allow the Holy Spirit to operate through you in whatever job or environment you're in. That's one of the marks of this next season of you as a body of people. Push it further. Verse 22 in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Verse before talks about Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone and the, 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 the work of the ministry gifts in the building. All that is really important. But the piece I want you to catch in this verse right now is that you're being built into a dwelling place of the Spirit. Now, that's both individual and corporate. 
there's a corporate dwelling when the people of God come together and all, all the pieces that, that God is speaking become to, and the prophetic begins to flow and the teaching begins to flow and the different elements of the fivefold begin to flow and as Laura begins to give a little bit of a prophetic release in the middle of her song and, and we, we hear that all the pieces that God's doing come together. That's the fact that you house the Holy Spirit. Now, if I'm a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, is that true more in the building or at work? Or is it all the time? If you're a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, then everywhere I go, I'm carrying the presence and power of God with me. We have a a lady in our church, her name is her name is Vicky. And if you looked at any dictionary, not this Vicky, another Vicky, if you looked at any dictionary, there would be a picture of Vicky beside the word timid. Because she was the most timid human being I probably have ever been around. Vicky has a perfect job. She works for a big company, but she's in the accounting office doing the bookkeeping with the door closed in her little room, and she is so happy. Well, one day they're in a Monday, don't know, don't, I, don't, I don't know if staff meeting or board meeting, I don't know what the meeting was, but the employees are all sitting around the table, and for some reason, everybody left except for the owner and Vicky. And the owner looks at Timid and he says, what's wrong with our company? Why aren't we prospering? And she looks at him. She says, because you're cheating your employees on wages every week. You're cheating your suppliers. You're cheating. And she went through all the ways that their books were being twisted. And then she looked up. <laughs> and this guy's in tears. He's not even a believer. He's a man from another religion. But truth penetrated his heart by the Spirit, and He corrected all those things, and that company's prospering today. That's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. That's the kingdom at work through you. That's the kingdom. We've got to be a people so full of the Spirit that we understand we're the dwelling place, we're the housing place of the Holy Spirit. Remember back in Genesis, let me pull the verse up. My brain doesn't remember like it used to. Slow. But it gets there. Genesis 16. Remember where, let's read that verse. Yeah, go, yeah 16. And when Jacob awakened out of his sleep, he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. Verse 17. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other than the house of God and the gate of heaven. Fascinating little piece of scripture there. Remember, Jacob's running for his life, and you know, he gets to this spot and he lays down and stone is a pillow. And he has this dream of angels ascending and descending. It's incredible. We, we know the story. We saw it as flannel graphs as kids. We, so Jacob wakes up and said, God was here and I didn't know it. And he, he, he stands up a rock and pours oil on it and says, this is Bethel. This is the house of God. Except it wasn't this rock. It was the person. Wherever Jacob laid down that night, God was going to show up. It wasn't the place, it was the person. Now Jacob's understanding the best he can understand, but the reality is, it's the person that's the house of God. 
It's the person that's the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and he wakes up and says, this is, this is amazing. God was here and I didn't know it. How many times have you ever had that thought? Ooh, that was a really good opportunity I just missed. That's, God was here and I didn't know it. I had an opportunity to share and I, man, I missed it. It was there and I, I got busy or whatever reason. He said, this is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. The house of God is the, the presence, the living, dwelling place. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the Holy Spirit at work in you, resident in you. You are the housing, the, the dwelling place on earth of God. As nice as this building is, it's not this building. And we don't mind buildings. I like buildings. But I like people more. Because people are the carriers of his presence. But J Jacob uses a second word there. He said, this is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. What does a gate do? A gate gives you access from the backyard to the front yard. The gate gives you an opening from one place to another place, from one realm to another place. So when you step into Walmart, do you have a Walmart here? You do have one. I thought you had a Walmart here. You know, there's some towns don't have them. I'm just shocked. <laughs> I'm teasing you. You step into the grocery store. What's your chain here, Kroger's? Yeah. Publix. Publix, Publix. You step into Publix. Safer than Walmart. You step into Publix. Did you know the moment you walked in that door, heaven has an access point to invade earth? You became the gate of heaven in that place. So when you walk into the store, you're a walking access point for heaven to evade earth. You're a walking access point for the power and presence of our King for healing or miracles or prophetic or encouragement, whatever needs to come to people in that place. You are the access point for that. We're not building a church to fill seats. We're building a people to change the city. We're calling a people to walk full of the Spirit so we can transform the city. God has done an incredible job in preparation of you as a group of people, but now He wants to anoint you with His power and presence in a way that actually brings transformation to society around you. We're not going to have a problem filling seats. This brings back a lot of memories today, actually. We, God instructed the 30 people that came together to form the church we planted in Springfield. There were 30th, and he instructed us to renovate a 1,000-seat sanctuary. We had 1,000 seats on the floor and 200 in the balcony, and there were 30 of us. <laughs> we kind of rattled in there a little bit. But people began to catch that they were the dwelling place of God and the gate of heaven. And we weren't inviting people to church to get saved. We were inviting the people who encountered the presence to come encounter more presence. I believe the growth in this place is going to be presence driven. The presence of God in you and through you and around you. Worship team, Kemp, my worship team. <laughs> that was awesome. It's clear. The sound, the harmony. Did they get that way by showing up on a Sunday morning? Or did they get that way by throughout the week singing, worshiping, loving on Jesus, building their harmony, developing? 
Sounded like the Von Trapp family singers this morning. Mm. We're not going to get to chapter 3 today. You are the house of God. You are the gate of heaven. God wants to break into us as people. Sometimes it's external. I mean, so a few years ago, on a Saturday night revival meeting, we had the glory cloud roll into our church. Most unbelievable night. And it's incredible. People got saved, healed, delivered for all at once. All of it happened at the same time because the glory filled the house. It was the most incredible glory. One of our elders had a son that was in deep, deep, deep rebellion. He wasn't there that night. He was asleep in his room about three miles from the building. And when the glory cloud rolled into our building, it rolled into his room. Woke him up, he got dressed, and he stumbles down to the building to find out what on earth is happening down there. Because the glory showed up. Now, I like that. I love it when God does it sovereignly. I love it when he comes in in a rush. But he comes in in a rush when his people are allowing and are being the dwelling place and being the gate of heaven. And now we're inviting his glory to come in in a whole new way. We're not sitting waiting for him to do it. We're doing what he's given us to do. And he comes and punctuates the obedience that we're walking in. That, I believe, is his heart for us.